ethics has a friendly face. Ethics is what you already do. Um, ethics is just about inquiring about what you already do and maybe helping you make a little bit better decisions um, to have a good life, a, a good family, a, a good society around you, and, and maybe live as part of a better humanity. It's Hi, folks, and welcome back to Blitzscaling a Startup. I'm Chris Ye, and I'm joined today by Stephen Keltz of Princeton University. Stephen is a distinguished lecturer and thinker in the field of ethics, and especially ethics as applied to technology, something which is super important, especially right now. So, Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion. What I love about having Stephen on is that a lot of people sort of view ethics as an afterthought when it comes to technology, or even worse, they mm -hmm. feel like technology is ethically neutral and that ethics are not a part of it. But that is patently false. Uh, just this week, as a matter of fact, Stephen and I were talking, my friend Jonathan Haidt's book the uh, on social media is the number one New York Times bestseller. Obviously, this is something that people care about. And so let's go ahead and dive in. Stephen, maybe first you can just Briefly introduce yourself and your background. Uh, you were at Harvard around the same time as my wife. You also were at Stanford. And so, of course, you know, as another Harvard Stanford guy or a Stanford Harvard guy, I always like having you on. Tell me about the life path that has brought you here. And, you know, because most of the time people don't ask about this, something I always love to hear. Tell me about where you grew up and how yeah. that influenced you. You know, it's interesting that you, that you asked that because I, I did get a chance to go to some of those fancy places, uh, right? But the great degree I'm most proud of is Chelmsford High School class in 1990. Uh, I grew up in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, I was a runner uh, as well. So my sport was really big to me. Um, but growing Distance, up there- uh, Distance, sprinting? I, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't check out your yeah. athletic record. Yeah, that's right. Um, Distance, uh, distance or sprinting. Uh, Cross country and then uh, 3,000 meters, 5,000 meters, right? Um, I still have so, a trim so you runner's can't... build, it looks like. So that's good. Are you still doing it? Man, I'm working on it, Chris. No, my, my knees gave out on me at about 38, and I started Ooh. to do uh, started to do some uh, more sedentary exercises. Uh, but yeah, I hit the gym. You can't see it here on the on the podcast, but I got some shelves here where the things I'm really proud of are, and they are actually things from uh, my running career. Nice. Um, so. Yeah, that was something I was really proud of. And, you know, growing up in New England uh, also, I, I had the Homer mentality, right? I'm, Bo I'm Boston Red Sox, New England Patriots all the time. Um, so loyalty uh, was really big to a New Englander. Um, but also the idea that, um, the idea of a, of a responsibility, um, you know, the Protestant uh, work ethic is strong uh, in, in New England. And it's not just about working, but it's about the idea that you also are responsible for the things that you uh, create. Um, working for money, but working for the good as well, I think was a strong value that I uh, grew up with. And because of that, I actually uh, gravitated in my educational career towards studying the history of corporations, history of property rights, all things that surround uh, corporations, but uh, the history of property rights, uh, the history of the economic idea of capitalism and et cetera. And uh, these are things that I thought uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s got, got a little bit distorted uh, through the lens of Milton Friedman. Friedman. And uh, I, I thought of myself as trying to bring back a, an earlier version of uh, capitalism, a friendlier version of capitalism. And, you know, I actually kind of think that technology companies today may be doing some of that. But that was what I studied. But I was, you know, immersed in old books up until about 2018, um, when I started to realize a lot of the stuff I was studying was also applicable to digital markets like Amazon was creating. And so, boom, I was in tech ethics and have, have been doing it basically for seven years. Wow. So there's so many different elements I want to touch on and, and pick at, even before we get to the notion of, of ethics and blitzscaling. But first, I do want to emphasize, so a lot of times now that, you know, Stephen, sadly, you and I are old. We are contemporaries who graduated <laughs> from college and high school the same year. And Middle so uh, Chris, something, that's it. it's sure, <laughs> mature and seasoned. <laughs> something that younger listeners may not appreciate is the amount of loyalty it took to be a Red Sox or Patriots fan in those days. True. So when you were growing up, the Boston Red Sox famously uh, lost the World Series. Uh, they were, they, they were, locked into this rivalry with the 86. Yankees who had won these championships. Meanwhile, the Patriots, you know, had lost the Super Bowl and Drew Bledsoe Destroyed came in, in, in a Super Bowl. 
And so mm-hmm. this is one of those situations where people think about Boston sports fans. Now I think, ah, oh, they're a bunch of homers and they just back Tom Brady and the Red Sox and they always win. This was a time when people literally thought that they would go through their entire lives as Boston sports fans without ever seeing a championship. That was why the title of Bill Simmons's book famously is now I can die in peace because he finally saw the Red Sox win. So I just want to reflect back on that and say, you don't understand folks who are young. This is real loyalty. This is, I am devoted to an idea, even though I assume that I will die without ever seeing the promised land. True. True. Yeah, I used to, people used to say to me, uh, and probably still would, uh, that you know, Boston fans were obnoxious because they were always rubbing it in people's faces about Tom Brady. All right, I don't like that. But I used to say, but you have to understand, right? Like, this is something they never thought would happen either. Uh, this to them still feels unreal. Um, and it leads to the boasting, maybe. And again, you know, to for Boston to within this period of time, back then when you were growing up, you at least had the Celtics. And hey, the oh, Celtics yeah, are amazing. back. So, you know, hopefully you get a chance to to make it down and see the Celtics every now and then. Yeah, still such a homer here, Chris. Uh, you know I'm for them. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so one of the things you touched upon is the notion of capitalism and capitalism and its relationship with society. And you referenced the fact that yeah. you know, basically one of the big shifts in the 20th century was Milton Friedman basically saying that the purpose, uh, the only sole measure of the firm is, and the only sole purpose of the firm is shareholder capitalism to enrich the shareholders, the owners of mm-hmm. the company. And I tend to agree with you. So my take on capitalism is this. I always tell everyone, listen, capitalism is an amazing technology. And it is an amazing technology for generating wealth by creating value. However, the nature of capitalism is that it generates inequality. The very incentives that allow it to properly allocate capital produce economic inequality. So asking capitalism to solve the problem of inequality is asking something that relies on something to eliminate that thing. It's just not going to work. Inequality is a solution that we need to tackle as a society. It cannot be tackled directly by free markets. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think that is likely, I think that is likely true. But the other thing is that the critique of inequality, I think, is implicit in the ideas that are capitalist, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so in other words, you, you don't get the same critique of inequality or the same discussion about equality at different levels of society if you are in a communist system. It's, it's just not the same, right? So what sort of equality we care about, uh, let's take it, moral equ- the moral equality of all humans, right? Absolutely crucial uh, to capitalism, right? And we would think the system not capitalist if a person had to qualify based on uh, based on race or based on membership in a particular religion uh, for a loan at the bank. And capitalism itself has continued to fight uh, those things and make access uh, to capital truly to those with the best ideas. Are we there? No. The patterns of society say it's not racially equally distributed or whatever. But the very push towards making access to markets and et cetera, yeah. more broadly uh, equal is implicit within um, the idea of capitalism itself. Correct, if, if access, could, yeah. making access equal. The opportunity, the outcomes yeah. may not be equal, but the access should be equal because the goal is to allocate capital and resources to those who can best use them regardless of race, gender, age, or creed or belief. Absolutely, right. Or it should so in its purest form. It's not always that way, unfortunately. No, it's not. But the ver- but the very idea of pushing to to get that access equal is implicit in the same ideas of property that are um, uh, you know that are the basis of uh, capitalism, right? And so then I would say the only qualification on what you said earlier is that I would say capitalism inherently produces outcome uh, correct inequality, outcome inequality. Um, You're right. That's great. And those. It, those we will care about morally for some of the same reasons we care about access uh, equality. So we will care about those uh, uh, about that outcome uh, inequality, and then we must fight it using other methods. Yeah. But I agree, and I think that the yeah. key technology for this is ultimately democracy, um, because I think people mm-hmm. fail to appreciate the core thing about democracy. If I were to boil it all down, 
is one person, one vote. We qualify it around age and citizenship and other things like that. But basically, one person, one vote, one citizen, one vote. And the reason that's so important is it says each human has inherent value simply by being human. It's not qualified by education. It's not qualified by wealth. Mm -hmm. It is simply the fact that you are a human being, that you have a voice in governing. And I think that that's radical. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, helped that New England is actually one of the things that really helped build. And it is the thing that counterbalances the outcome inequality of capitalism. Yeah. And my, uh, an object of my uh, scholarship for many years was uh, John Locke, who I, who I just adore. Right. Yeah. But some people who don't like, uh, don't like John Locke or don't like his uh, political ideas said that when he spoke about democracy, he was in fact only speaking about the, the bourgeois um, uh, claiming a, a role from their sort of feudal uh, lords. And there wasn't a lot of feudalism around in the 1690s, but there was still some hangover from it. Um, so that it was about bourgeois control. And to a certain degree, that's, that's true. The, the rising bourgeois, the rising merchant uh, class used the language of equality to seize uh, democratic control over uh, England. And then they were like, whoops, <laughs> look, look, look what we unleashed here. But for Locke himself, I think it was actually quite uh, real. He had a Puritan upbringing himself. Uh, he could, what, could have well fit uh, in the New England that I grew up in. Um, and he really meant it as an aspirational idea. And again, I gotta say, are we there yet? No, nope. no. But the fact that we're fighting for it is part of the core of those same ideas of property, democracy, um, access uh, to opportunity. Locke wasn't a capitalist yet. It was just too early for that. But yeah. it's part of those same core ideas that are unfolding over the course of time. We are working towards uh, becoming capitalists. Though maybe I hope not in Milton Friedman's version of that. But Right. And the duality, uh, you know, again, many people have pointed this out and I'm not the first, I'm just stealing from them. But the duality of these relationships are often seen by the fact that everyone remembers Adam Smith's wealth of nations and they forget the theory of moral sentiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Now, I have a question and I don't know whether it's best handled now or later. So I'm going to open it up to you and your wisdom will help me decide. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is interesting to me is... You know, a part of capitalism, it's not necessarily inherent in it, but it is one of the primary outgrowths is the corporation. And yep. of course, you know, I think back to Coase and the nature of the firm, which is the kind of stuff I mm -hmm. studied when I was at Harvard Business School. And one of the thoughts that came to me is I am wondering how the technology of artificial intelligence will alter the considerations when it comes to transaction cost and coordination cost. Do you think mm -hmm. that artificial intelligence ultimately pushes us towards larger firms, smaller firms, a different distribution of firm size and, and focus? How do you think AI and its ability to affect transaction costs and coordination costs affects the traditional mm -hmm. classical theories of the firm? Wow. I such a big question. Um, I, I feel like you should ask it uh, later because it'll be 24 hours before we're to the bottom of that uh, question. <laughs> but, you know, so one of the things I had a paper a couple, couple of years ago in an, in an engineering journal, actually. The, IEEE, the IEEE, right? Electrical engineers. Yeah. I never thought as a historian of political thought I'd be publishing in an engineering journal, but there you go. Um, but it was about, uh, it was about this question of firms. So, so one thing is, I think, I think that by the 70s and certainly with the advent of information communication technology firms in the 80s 90s early 2000s we had moved beyond the transaction cost um explanation of the firm in other words the transaction cost explanation just didn't have the explanatory power that it did anymore uh, for explaining what was interior to the firm the interior Correct. organization and its relation to capital uh to tell you the truth um Coase and Oliver Williamson kind of had actually no explanation of what was going on interior to the firm. Interior structure just didn't matter to the transaction cost explanation. Uh, so I'll say, I think that the, the type of organization that Google was famous for until recently, they seem to have had a McKinsey style um, reorg. <laughs> but the type of organization they were famous for, which was the self-organizing and self-reorganizing team structure within being really the core of the innovative uh, component of Google, that is something that AI-based companies are going to need to lean into hard. Uh, 
because, especially because there are so many competitors uh, in the space, but there's gonna have to be so much expensive testing and iterating of different applications of uh, large language models or any other predictive AI. Um, there's gonna have to be so much testing and iterating on this that you may have to have actually research projects going on in multiple arenas, even going towards some of the same goals, right? We want a product that does X, that works with this customer base, et cetera, et cetera. You may have, have to have competing teams on that, and they may need to be pulling talent from each other and from other teams as they encounter new problems in figuring out how to control these, um, uh, these machines. Does, does that make sense? No, no, that, that, that definitely helps. Although there is an irony there. I was speaking with someone from Google who shall, or formerly from Google, who shall remain nameless to protect them. Uh, but he was telling me, because you know, one of the things that's always been mysterious to me is Google has been investing in AI so from, from an early stage, earlier before almost any other company in a serious way, at least these new technologies. As we all know, the attention is all we need, all you need. Paper was written by Google researchers, and that is the basis of the LLMs that we have today. Google, of course, has one of the world's largest supplies of computing power and economic power as well. Why is it that mm -hmm. they were beaten to the punch by OpenAI? The explanation that's been publicly given is, well, it's because we're more concerned with safety than OpenAI. But that, to me, rings false. I'm like, <laughs> Google concerned with mm -hmm. safety. Interesting. Um, what I heard was, the and again, this was just one person's interpretation. He said, here is the issue. The governance of Google internally is a marketplace. And the marketplace mm -hmm. is the allocator of computing power as well as talent. And the issue was that in terms of pursuing the LLM strategy and building a model, there was so much competition that Google's resources were never going to be able to be concentrated on a single effort. And what allowed OpenAI to beat Google to the punch was the fact that they said, we're betting it all on this. And mm -hmm. Google's structure did not allow them to do that or did not lead to them doing that. And that's why OpenAI, despite being vastly smaller and less resourced, albeit with the help of Microsoft, significantly resourced, was able to beat Google to the punch, even though Google had the, all the precursors to this. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that some of those things are fortuitous, uh, though, right? Like, I don't think anybody really was uh, predicting the ability of the transformer architecture to not only produce the quality of language that they got GPT-4 uh, to produce, but then be able, but then be able to flip it fairly easily to producing images uh, oh, to a multimodal application. That was definitely a surprise. Language alone right. is sufficient to justify developing the technology, but the capabilities right. of, of the multimodal, the imagery, now video, voice, all of these things were unexpected, along with things like translation, despite only putting English language corpus in. I mean, this was pretty crazy stuff, but yeah. I think that right. they did, at, at, from an early point in time, probably by 2018 or so, believe that the transformer model would be transformative, if you will. So I think that mm -hmm. it was, right. I think that they didn't know exactly how it would play out, but I think there was enough early indications that by 2018, people were placing their bets. Yeah. I think it's fair to say they had a bunch of legacy products um, yeah. and research lines around image generation, around yeah. voice generation and et cetera. And so if you actually, you know, sit with a Google engineer and an NDA, they'll show you some of the things that they were already able to do, um, right? W without the transformer architecture, exactly. uh, et cetera. And the legacy products might have might have sort of slowed them down. But um, we, we all know that the transformer architecture, that LLMs are actually going to only push to a particular frontier. Correct. Well. They're amazing, amazing That's performance. Right. But to get past that frontier, yes. you're going to have to bring in, bring back in semantic uh, systems of a sort. Absolutely. And so the companies that were continuing to think about that had always thought about that are now going to have a leg up on what the next, you know, the next thaw. If, if we're in a bit of a, of an AI fall right now, which I think we are not an AI winter, we're in a bit of an AI fall right now. The next thaw is is going to be around, um, you know, plugging in some other architectures and getting them to do new things. Yeah, one of the things I like to tell people is I draw an analogy to the wave of our youth, uh, the dot com wave, the internet wave, and I tell people 
as difficult as this is to understand, the first encounter that folks like you and I had with the internet was through a command line interface. And we could access Unix systems at our universities and use email clients like Elm and Pine that are, again, based purely on text. And this was how we access things via the command line. And what I tell people is, you know, really, we're in the command line phase of AI right now. I mean, the vast majority mm -hmm. of how people interact with AI that they perceive as AI, admittedly, people interact with AI all day, all day mm -hmm. long, without even realizing it. But what they perceive as AI, they typically are currently interacting with, with what is essentially a command line interface, which is nuts. And I was just having a bit of a conversation, you know, one of those online conversations yeah. with someone you don't really know, but um, but I learned a lot from the video that he had, he had made. And and the the actual, if you think about that, that the command line interface is the text block in interface for exactly. let's say even Gemini, right? Exactly. And it's really blunt. It's really bad UI uh, actually. And then the the controversy over Gemini a couple of weeks ago about producing uh, pictures of the American founders, which may or may not have been what the user wanted. <laughs> well, part of that is because. You, they're, they're giving you a blunt command line interface and then they're trying to expand your prompt behind the scenes. Exactly. The machine, right. Why not give you the control of that? Right. Hey, mate, I, I may want pictures of the American founders that are racially diverse. Right. Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, wanted that and he made exactly. a million people inspired by it. That's maybe what I want. But you're not giving me an actual control interface that I can use to uh, to adjust these things. So. Yeah. And that's the, that is the thing, right? We have this command line interface, which again, I would point out is not how we generally deal with the world. So I don't think this is where it ends, mm -hmm. but your point is there's also a remarkable opacity, right? The black box is not just the LLM itself. It's all the intermediary activity between your typing and what is actually going into the LLM as well. And yeah. some of that is, uh, again, I think a lot of that is absolutely necessary. I mean, I think that the direct yeah. access is is difficult to manage and most people probably could not effectively get what they want out of it, but it does produce these a, interesting artifacts. Yeah, yeah. And, and here's a way in which I think that explanation about safety is correct uh, of Google, right? You can see from what they're doing, just from that Gemini instance yeah. alone, you can see they don't want to give you direct control into that black box. Right, they are really trying to mediate your experience um, with that machine, and and uh, you know so is OpenAI. Yes, um, absolutely. They're really trying to mediate your experience because, man, you know what you know. We know what they can produce. Um, some things that we give a black eye to Google and OpenAI and, and etc. Right. So safety is at least in as in as much as that, reputationally speaking, safety is a concern. And this is a be beautiful illustration of how we began, which is to say that this is capitalism at work. This is not wokeism or whatever bizarre term people use to describe this. This is corporations that are for-profit entities, or at least partially for-profit in the case of OpenAI because of its bizarre hybrid structure. But they're making choices based on expected value, based on what they think will allow them to deliver a shareholder return, in addition to obviously having you know, human beings at the helm thinking about what values they care about as well with, uh, yeah. with you know, a, a, an employee base that cares about these things, right? These things are all balanced. There's no one factor that determines everything. Yeah. And so that's one of the points that I make um, in that article that I referenced earlier in uh, IEEE is that for this reason, uh, ICT companies and now AI uh, companies are inherently ethics affecting in the in the language of Jim Moore, the, the, the famous Dartmouth uh, scholar, right? That is, as they combine these areas of knowledge uh, together in order to make a product that affects uh, humans, they, they cannot but think about the effect on humans. Yeah. Are they motivated solely by the profit? I don't think so. But I also I'm not sure that I would care so long as the motivation provide, provided them sufficient impetus to think about all the effects they could be having on humans. It, it could be a profit-driven motive along with regulation. Uh, it could be training of the engineers for ethics on the inside of the company, something that I've uh, worked on, et cetera. But it's, it's, if this combination of forces gets them to think sufficiently about uh, the short, intermediate, and long-range uh, effects on uh, humans of their products, that's good enough for me. 
Exactly. We, we, <laughs> there are many pathways to the outcomes we want and what we care about, of course, are the outcomes. Now the process matters along the way. We want a process that is inclusive enough for everyone to, for as many people as possible to view it as legitimate. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think that that is also a part of, that is one of the things that I think the technology companies often overlook, which is the feeling of the public, the users, the policymakers, folks on the outside of the firm, that there is some level of transparency, that their voices are being listened to, is a mm -hmm. critical part of the legitimacy of those firms. I mean, just as it would be for the legitimacy of government. They don't think about it that way, but I think that that's really true. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why in, in my work, I focus on process like agile and the structure of uh, the firms, because I do think that that contributes to it as well. The, um, you know, for, for people who are listening, who do want their dose of uh, ethics, you sometimes hear in, in conversations, the, the notion that if these decisions were driven by the profit motive, they are somehow uh, lesser or they are to be judged or they're not real um, motivations. That is a particular philosophical perspective that tends to attach itself to duty bound um, ways of thinking, sometimes called deontological, sometimes associated with Immanuel Kant or Christine Korsgaard or Thomas Scanlon uh, and et cetera. Right? So there is an ethical tradition which says that the ethical act is judged in part by the motive that drove it. So I'm obviously not in that tradition because I'm saying there could be a series of lanes uh, or whatever that are all providing impetus for a decision that ends up being um, uh, ethical and good uh, for society. Uh, but I think that people should realize that, that they're, they may not, even if they accept the idea that a profit driven uh, motive is somehow condemnable uh, or somehow not real, uh, et cetera, you know, if they took it really far and actually looked into all the other corollaries that come along with that particular judgment, uh, they might be a little less comfortable with that judgment. Dewey based theory is not everyone's cup of tea. Well, I, I and I completely agree with you. I mean, again, I do not have the depth of philosophical and ethical background that you have, but to what extent I do have that from my studies over time, I've always been much more of a utilitarian. I've always focused on outcomes. I'm a pragmatist in those two different traditions. Mm, yeah, and if I and if I had to choose a camp, uh, you know, coming from the politics and policy world, I, I never had to join one of the teams. Uh, but if I had to choose uh, a camp, I would be what what is called a virtue ethicist, right? Um, and then then the focus would really be on uh, whether the practices and iterated activities of, say, being in the corporation or or whatever, become a, become a character trait, which then uh, drives you towards further ethical action. So they become almost an unthinking habit. So that yeah. then, well, you learned it by by the by the regulation, but now you do it just because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Now, one of the big papers that you wrote, and we're now halfway through, over halfway through, but we are we we'll persevere because I think now is a good time to bring it up. One of the things that you've written about is the ethical implications of things like the agile development framework. Again, these are not things Scrum mm -hmm. and and whatnot. People don't think of this as having ethical implications, and yet yeah. they do. Uh, talk more about that because that's really fascinating. Yeah, so I run a program on our campus called Agile Ethics, which is about to uh, about to expand. It's uh, a role player simulation program for uh, students, especially for computer science students, so they can get a little experience about what it looks like to make decisions within uh, the Agile process. And so, what's the reason for that? What's the ethical reason for that? Well. Some ethical theories focus a lot more on decision-making process than others uh, do. Utilitarianism, for instance, doesn't really focus on uh, the process. It's just about the state of the world that you bring about. How would we ethically judge that, right? How did you come to the decision? Well, it could be by a rule. It could be by, it could be flipping a coin. It could be, well, it couldn't be flipping a coin, no. uh, right? But it could be various different processes could get you there. Uh, but other ethical traditions focus a lot on what decision-making looks like. And there's psychological research as well that ethics, before you can even get to the point of making a judgment using a theory, you need to be aware that you are in a situation that requires special judgment. I sometimes use the example with students uh, buying a hot dog on the street uh, in New York City, we don't ordinarily think of, or we don't need to really think of as ethical. It is, it's market-based, it's a transaction, it's personal, it is ethical, but, but by habit, we just do it. Uh, but uh, if you walked away realizing you never put the $5 down uh, on the cart, you all of a sudden would have uh, uh, 
be shocked aware and be like, now I must make an ethical decision. Do I go back or yeah. whatever, whatever. So a lot of it is how do you, within the agile, very fast development process where roles are sometimes splintered, how do you become aware of the information you need to know that you are in an ethically fraught situation, that this thing you're creating is going to have a human effect, which could be bad. How do you become aware that you're in that situation and potentially pull information out of uh, your other partners on the agile development uh, team? How do we surface the information that we need to become aware because only then can judgment intent and behavior actually flow so it, it's about that yeah and to me this speaks to things that i'm often wrestling with uh, which are the combination of unintended consequences and the subcategory of that which are emergent unintended consequences right because there are unintended consequences that occur when people have a good intention and they do something but they don't think about the implications but what makes it particularly mm -hmm. difficult are the emergent unintended consequences where different things interact where the things you do interact with the things that other people do that you may not even be aware of and those things then mm -hmm. produce overall unintended consequences that are different than those that you actually set out to accomplish and that's where yes. You know, we often, and this is like, uh, again, Ethics 101, so I apologize for you, but I think it's good for the listeners. This is why there is that old saying, the path to hell is paved with good intentions, right? From an ethical perspective, good intentions alone are not enough, at least for most schools, yeah. right? People approach a lot of things. Very few people would ever say, you know, I go in about my work with bad intentions. They almost always go about with good intentions and get people with good intentions with good ethics, with good values, produce bad outcomes. Yeah. And so the, the word I, uh, I like to add on to intention is anticipation. Mm. Um, so that's the holy grail in a lot of different uh, frameworks. There's a, a paper, Stilgo and McNaughton, or Framework for Responsible Innovation that I highly recommend uh, to people. But, th but there's others as well um, about about how anticipation plays a role in uh, responsible innovation. And again, when you're talking about ICTs and AI, where the effect on society is going to be multiplied, potentially massive effects right. for any product that ends up getting adopted, becoming the, the leading product, uh, the anticipation of those things is something that I'm trying to basically teach uh, engineers as part of the design process. And you maybe need you know, within a within a development team that's working with uh, AI, you maybe need to um, really lean in to the user experience uh, role a bit more, right? Uh, you need to tell someone, yeah, that, that your role is thinking through anticipation. Are you interacting with focus groups of potential customers? Are we thinking about uh, the effect on the user? Are we doing as much anticipatory work as we can be doing? And then after rollout of the product, are we doing as much monitoring uh, as we can be doing? Um, really just in order to make our product be the thing that we want it to be, to sell a lot, great but really even to perform the service we wanted to perform, we need to be doing more of those anticipatory acts. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, I think that, I feel like this is one of the fundamental tensions, which is, you know, there is this notion, uh, because we live here in America, land of the free, bald eagles screaming overhead and what have you, that freedom, more freedom, more choice, more options is always better. And yet, if we look at, you know, again, the social media that Jonathan Haidt is writing about, especially Instagram, for example, this is a case of just giving people more freedom, giving them more options, making it easy for them to take photographs and share them with their friends, produces these consequences around self-esteem, self-image, mental health, that, again, the creators, I can assure you, uh, Mike Krieger and Kevin Systrom never, ever thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not sure that I would say that giving people more options expands uh, their freedom. That wouldn't to me be the definition of freedom. I, I don't want to keep on going back to uh, John Locke, but um, made a differentiation between license uh, and liberty. Um, mm. And, you know, liberty is, uh, in fact, decision making license is, is a form of decision making, which is could even be random, uh, and etc. And you could say, I'm, I'm free because I have the capacity just randomly to decide tomorrow to be a different Stephen than I was today or something like that, right? Um, but liberty might involve me in, 
you know, choice making within systems of uh, responsibility. So I, I, I do kind of have a responsibility yeah. to, to you, Chris, or to whoever, uh, to live up to the promises I made yesterday. I'm not just a different Stephen tomorrow. Um, so, so I'm not sure that expanding people's option sets is the definition of freedom. Either. I do think that this but, is an important ethical distinction that perhaps this country needs to hear more of. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'll try it. I'm not going to go to anybody anybody's freedom forum and uh, and and, uh, and and necessarily say that. I don't. They think might be like heavily that. armed. It's always a good idea to proceed with caution. True. Um, but but therefore, if what you're thinking about doing is expanding people's choice sets, you, you, you realize that you are putting. You're not just giving them more freedom. You are potentially putting a knife uh, in their hands, um, right? And when you think about it that way. Yeah, I mean, hey, if you're a knife maker, you want to sell knives, uh, right? Um, but these social media technologies, like you were referencing, uh, et cetera, they can be used in, in all sorts of uh, different and potentially um, dangerous ways. And so I, I, I don't think it's too much to say you should think about the knife that you're putting into people's hands. You should think about how it's going to be used. You should think about how to design it more safely or whatever it might be. I think that that's absolutely true. Now, as promised, we are blitzscaling a startup, so we do talk about blitzscaling. And I think mm -hmm. that you also had some thoughts about the ethics of blitzscaling, the ethical implications. And so since we have, you know, these two thinkers, you and me, on the, the, the podcast right now, we might as well dive into it. Talk about the ethical implications, the ethical consequences, the ethical dilemmas of blitzscaling, which to remind the listeners, although you probably all know, is prioritizing speed over efficiency in order to win a valuable winner take most market. Right, right. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I'll say I think especially AI uh, presents a new challenge uh, for blitzscaling. Um, and the new challenge is, is this, that Let's say you have a development team within your uh, corporation that is actually uh, training a model. Um, they, they've got, you know, Mixtral, a particular version of Mixtral, and they're and they're fine tuning it, uh, and etc. Well, the end deployment uh, of that model is going to depend, and the the ability to actually be the product you want it to be, that is, to perform well for the client, uh, the end user uh, of it that performance at the end is going to rely a lot on the choices that are made of the training data set they used for the fine tuning, um, right? And information like that, if it doesn't get passed along to to deployment, uh, to the people who are deploying it as a product, if it doesn't get passed along to future members of uh, the company, you're just going to have a bad product. It's not going to perform the way you want it to perform. And it's going to go off the rails in ways that are actually quite anticipatable and will give your company a black eye. So one condition, hey, as you're blitzing, you've got to be real careful to record the reason why you are using a particular data set. Um, if, you're if you're actually training a model, something like a model card. Um, and so all of a sudden, documentation fell out of favor when people were moving away from waterfall, with AI documentation has got to come back in yeah. and it's going to slow down the blitz a bit. Um, yeah. But but, that, but, but, that, but that's could be okay, right? The thing about blitz scaling, and I always remind people mm -hmm. of this, is that it is relative and contextual. And so blitz scaling does not say you must always move as fast as you possibly can at all times. It says that you should use speed as a competitive tool and using speed as a competitive tool should also include some element of anticipation, hence the chapter on responsible blitzscaling, because the things yeah. that we're dealing with here are so powerful and have such broad reaching impact on the world. I mean, the systemic impact yeah. of social media goes far beyond what people originally anticipated. And But as that impact became clear, it became more and more incumbent morally on the leaders of those companies to actually begin considering these issues, which it feels like sometimes they have not. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And if I, you know, if there's a blitz scaling 2.0, I'd have a suggestion, which is to move that last chapter, the responsibility chapter first for the age of AI. <laughs> what um, we've discovered right. is that yeah, people don't read the last chapters. They read the first few chapters and then they're like, oh, great, let me go out and do it. And yeah, that was, uh, that yeah. was a, a mistake. Uh, I think you're yeah. absolutely right about the second edition. 
Uh, and because I think you guys have an example in there um, about, and you say, when you're at the family stage, sit down and actually think about what's going to happen when you're at the nation stage, all right? What if you became the, I think the example you use is, what if you became the world's leading company in this space? Exactly. What processes would you have to have? What would your effect on society be? Uh, sit down and, you know, do some ideation on that. You, you, careful what you wish for, because your dream might come true. Exactly. Um, and that helps you That helps you steer where you are right now and what choices you're going to make. So I, I think you guys are 100% right in that chapter. I would make it the introduction, though. <laughs> yeah. And I also would say that they should, those companies, if they are really serious about this, maybe they should seek out the assistance of an ethicist or somebody who is experienced in these fields. Because... I, the fact is, most of the time, founders don't have even as much grounding in philosophy and ethics as I have, let alone the vast amount that you have. And, you know, I have found uh, working with engineers, I've been uh, involved in some s small number of products with uh, uh, of engagements with um, uh, people at Google who run workshops there that are called their moral imagination workshops. You can find their paper about that online. Um, but... Um, we have found over the course of time that it actually doesn't require significant ethics knowledge mm -hmm. the ability to explain Immanuel Kant or something like that. Uh, it, it, it could re require really actually sort of small prompting on what different theories uh, there are out there. And then people, you know, a, a bit like GPTs themselves are able to actually unspool from a very small um, explanation what else is consequent upon adopting a particular ethical theory. And they're able to actually kind of identify like, oh, it turns out I am, I, I can't, that's kind of the way I think. And it, it turns out you think a little bit differently on this. And, and so there's not much that's needed in terms of ethics prompting. Um, you know, and that's why I've moved in, in my work with engineering yeah. students. Uh, I still teach Immanuel Kant. Um, uh, for you know ethics and morality classes, that's a, a gen ed requirement for my yeah. for my Princeton students. So I'm still teaching that content in some places, but not to engineering students. I I don't think they really need to know um, Kant or the interior workings of Bentham's ideas or or whatever. Um, or the fact they can find Bentham's stuffed body on display in England. That everybody needs to know, and that he's <laughs> rolled out once a year. Isn't it on his own birthday? I think so. Uh, and truly, thought it would be good for mankind to continue to remember him and his uh, contributions. Uh, I'm going to have to try to remember that for my own will. Uh, you know, this <laughs> what what you bring up in terms of thinking about how AI can help people with ethics. Like we've been talking about the ethics of AI. How does LLM technology and the things that are happening now potentially impact the ethics field? How can you use this technology to spread ethics more broadly or make it easier for people who do not have an ethics background to better grapple with these issues? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, that and I've tried, to, I've tried to look into it. So, you know, specifically, I think that the, um, the role plays that I do with students are highly effective. And we actually had our psychology department study people who had gone through these role plays and, and uh, measure things about their ability to anticipate um, uh, future outcomes from a technology, about their, their caution around gathering information that they needed, about, about their um, desire actually to talk to diverse stakeholder groups, right? And all of these metrics that we were looking for moved in, in the right direction, small, but statistically significant motions, right? Mm. So given that, um, I, I really actually would like to take these role plays and turn them into an LLM-based interaction, interactive system so that a person could actually kind of do one of these role plays, play as a member of a team. If you're an engineer, play as a user experience designer. Yeah. Think from their perspective how the team should operate differently and what information is needed and et cetera. Um, and that's something we make all these role plays uh, broadly available so they could be used by any university. My idea is if I ever turned it into a technology, I would also make it uh, broadly available. I, I'm, I'm not a startup guy, um, but I am hoping eventually to have an LLM based um, uh, role play that could, could spread this effect. Well, that would be fantastic. And that brings us to something which, as you probably know, being a veteran of this, is a critical part of every podcast episode, which is we have to let people know where they can find you, how they can learn more about you, how they can engage with you over time. So maybe you can share your website, your social media coordinates, and what people should do if they are fascinated by this conversation and say, I can't get enough of Stephen Kelts and I want to follow his work and I want to start to really grapple with these issues. 
boy, if they're saying those things, I question their judgment. But uh, but yeah, you can you can certainly you can find me on LinkedIn um, or, you know, my email address is just my last name at um, at my university. So go ahead. Um, and, and that's and, Kelts, uh, K-E-L-T-S, K-E-L-T-S that's at Princeton.edu. That's right. Yep. Fantastic. And what is next for you? So here you are, like me, you are a seasoned professional. You're at what my fr- friend Chip Connolly describes as the midlife chrysalis, right? We are at an age where we have experienced a lot and in your case, uh, accomplished a lot, but then what do the next decades hold? What's got you excited? What's got you scared? What do you want to see over the next, you know, half century or so? Man, that, that is such a uh, question, uh, Chris. I hope you and I get to hang uh, at some point and, uh, so and do talk I. about that question. Because, you know, we actually, me and some of my buddies from college have a, have a signal uh, group that we call Uphill Both Ways in the 90s, um, <laughs> uh, where we talk about a lot of this stuff. And we've seen a lot of people go through the midlife crisis part of the chrysalis um, where they feel constrained. And honestly, I can happily report to you that I had a big win uh, this year and the agile ethics role plays. um, I'm now actually basically moving into uh, our center for information technology policy to work directly with our computer science department on building out ethics curricula for engineers. So, this thing that I've been pushing forward for four or five years uh, now, and I thought would fail, um, really is getting adopted as as maybe one of the core offerings uh, for ethics uh, for computer science students at Princeton, and that just feels like such a huge win to me. I, I'm just I'm just so proud of it. Um, small small win, maybe I don't know. I'm proud. No, of it. no, no. Yeah. It it has a huge impact. I mean, this is I just spent this past week working with the Center for reinventing and reforming public education. And one of the points that I made to them is that artificial intelligence and its role in education is so important because what we have is the opportunity to dramatically improve education, which as a capitalist, I then refer to as human capital formation. Uh, We have the ability to dramatically improve that. And then if that capital or education is then further amplified by the amplifying effects of artificial intelligence, you see this dramatic impact we can have on the world, right? We can Mm -hmm. educate our young people far better than we ever could before. And each individual Mm -hmm. can have greater impact than ever before. So that Mm -hmm. combination of increases creates a a massive impact. And I think it's fantastic that you are shaping those young people to better anticipate and think about ethics and think about the implications to avoid some of the things that our generation has brought upon the world. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I've given a few talks uh, recently about um, the in, uh, about the effect of AI uh, on education and, and how we can use it actually to improve the methods of inquiry that our students uh, engage in. I think that is possible. We're all worried that they'll use LLMs uh, basically just to produce a finished paper, and yeah, that's that's not good. Um, but if you teach them a process of how to engage yeah. with an LLM maybe they become better inquirers. I think they can. Absolutely. And this is the thing, right? At the end of the day, obviously, education serves many purposes. But one of the purposes of education is to help prepare our young people for what they're going to encounter as they move on in the world, generally into the world of work. And and the question I would ask everyone is, do you expect that this the, the students of today, when they're working in a couple of years, are going to be using AI or not using AI? And the answer is, of course, they'll be using AI. Their organizations will require them to use AI. So helping them grapple with those issues now in a setting where we can better consider ethics and implications Absolutely, and anticipation yeah. is essential. Yeah, the ostrich strategy just is not going to work. I do know people who simply just put on a syllabus, you may not use AI. Yeah. And they're like, I have an AI policy. But to me, that doesn't <laughs> make sense. Um, you you got to actively say, I mean, wh- why not load some uh, PDFs of a book by Peter Singer, a, yeah. a very valued uh, colleague of mine, uh, a guy I like very much. Why not load some PDFs of Peter Singer work at work in there and actually teach students to uh, inquire, uh, right? Yeah. To ask about examples. Could you give me a counter example to the example that Singer, what's a criticism uh, that people have used of Peter Singer's work, right? Teach them how to engage. That's almost the holy grail of education. Now more possible, we're closer to it because of the way LLMs work fairly well, very well. <laughs> 
I think that is a beautiful vision and something that is really important. We are almost out of time. So I will ask you, Stephen, are there any final things, any final thoughts, questions I should have asked, anything you'd like to touch on before we run out of time? Uh, no, I don't think so. Big, big uh, question uh, there. But, you know, ethics is, I guess the, the final tagline I'd, I'd, I'd want to give people, um, uh, people, especially people who are startup founders, who are reading Blitzscaling for the business advice, et cetera, is, you know, ethics has a friendly face, right? Everybody says to me, ethics is a nice to have, not a need to have, um, uh, you know, un until AI, um, they were saying that, now they're scared. Um, or they say, ethics just sounds like control from the outside and et cetera. Ethics has a friendly face. Ethics is what you already do. Um, ethics is just about inquiring about what you already do and maybe helping you make a little bit better decisions um, to have a good life, a, a good family, a, a good society around you, and, and maybe live as part of a better humanity. It's, it's ethics as a friendly face, you know, come search us out. Absolutely. In this case, for this episode of Blitzscaling a Startup, that friendly face has been Stephen Keltz of Princeton University. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. I think you can tell I've enjoyed this greatly. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Absolutely have, Chris. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to, after this podcast, hopefully at some point in time, getting together in person, either when I'm out there on the East Coast or when you're visiting Silicon Valley, the Christian and the Lion's Den, if you will. Uh, looking forward mm -hmm. to that so much. Stephen, thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Chris. This was really fun. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>